So here we are, week number two, week number two of this series that we're calling Doubt It. Somebody say, Doubt It. Oh, yeah, I love it. And I told the story of where all that came from with the crazy teenagers at my house constantly. Um, last night we had about, I think, 47 teenagers packed into our kitchen because Pastor Kerry decided, since we're fasting, she'll make the teenagers chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> what? What are you doing? What are you doing? Anyway, uh, they smelled really good, but it made me really angry, you know what I mean? Um, so anyway, we've got teenagers at the house all the time. It's not always as good as it sounds. Um, you know, you can, you can catch up on that last week. Hey, listen, if you haven't already, make sure that you check in on your social media platform because what that does is it lets people know there is a church that would probably take them uh, if it takes you, Okay. And, uh, and then also what we do with that is we make a donation on your behalf. We told you for a year plus now that we're in partnership with a ministry in Bulgaria called City Point Church. And uh, Pastor Bojidar there and his team, they oversee 25 churches, a network of 25 churches. And their heart is to have a soup kitchen in connection with each and every one of those uh, churches. However, they only have two or three right now. So our goal in partnership with them is to continue to build uh, that that dream with them, right? Um, and last week we told you that we sent one of our very own, Cherokee Horton, uh, to be in Bulgaria. She arrived, everybody, and sent Pastor Carrie and I pictures of her apartment. So this is where she's living there in Bulgaria. They, um, they were able to take some of the money that we have, look at Chuck hanging out in the back, he's like, eh, that's a lot of travel, man, you know what I'm saying? Um, anyway, they were, they were able to take some of those resources that we've sent their way and, uh, and outfit a, they call it a flat, uh, there for her to live in, which is super, super cool. Thank you for so many of you that, that responded and said, hey, I want to give specifically to Cherokee. And so what we realize is that we've had such an outpouring of um, generosity that not only are we going to be able to uh, literally make Cherokee a Mercy City uh, missionary, but there are going to be more opportunities for us to have more Mercy City missionaries in the very near future. So thank you guys. 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 All right. Somebody say doubt it. That's what I'm talking about. I heard a couple people say it like you really mean it, like doubt it. Doubt it. Week number two of our series called Doubt It. Last week I preached a message called Undivided and we talked about how we became we become a person whose focus and faith is undivided when we live in a culture that is continually, daily giving us a dose of doubt. We talked about how God has given us faith and how we can align ourselves to it daily, how we can be people that are undivided. Today I want to preach a message that I've entitled Unbelief. Somebody say unbelief. And what I really want to do is I want to encourage those of us who know that God can, but sometimes get caught questioning why he hasn't. I want to lean into the idea of those of us who struggle to believe it, especially when we can't see it. I think that God wants to encourage us, give us some courage, offering us the opportunity to fix our focus on more of his truth today. I believe that God wants to speak to us today. Do you believe that? And I believe that he's got a healthy dose where the world tries to offer us a, a dose of doubt. God has a healthy dose of faith to overcome doubt and help our unbelief. Are you guys on board with that? Yeah. Come on, everybody. Me too. Me too. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We are so grateful for the wonderful opportunity we have today to be in your presence. We do not take it lightly. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. And so, God, we pray today that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would lead us and you would guide us. You would show us Jesus in a more real, clear, and powerful way than we've ever seen him before. God, because we know it's upon revelation of who Jesus is, that you build your church, that you establish life in us, that you allow faith to arise within us, 
And your word says that when you do establish your church, that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So every bit of daily dosage of doubt that comes our way, we would be able to rise above and overcome by the spirit of the living God. So God, I pray in Jesus' name that your spirit would arise, that faith would arise, that we would become people of prayer, that we would become people of power, that we would become people who see your word for what it is. It's the truth that changes us and makes our lives more. God, do in us today, do through us today what only you can. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, everybody. Give somebody next to you a little knuckle bump and tell them, let's lean in. Let's lean in. Let's lean in. So if you got your Bibles today, you can open up to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, and we'll dive in very, very quickly. But as we do, I just kind of want to set up this portion of Scripture because, you know, some stuff has been going down at this point in time with Jesus and and Jesus, Mark is, Mark is one of my favorite books of the Bible to read because it's kind of, um, it's fast paced. You know what I'm saying? Like it, you jump into the book of Mark and all of a sudden, man, it's already miracles. It's already signs. It's already one. It's already Jesus moving. It's already things. You're like, whoa. It's like you're, you're, you're in a car um, with your, your crazy uncle, you know what I mean, who drives 25 miles an hour over the speed limit. That's what reading Mark is like. It's like, yo, Uncle Mark, this is dope. Let's go. You know what I'm saying? That's what reading the book of Mark is like. And I know a Mark like that. <laughs> Crazy uncle. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so, so what, what happens is there's already stuff happening, but Jesus and his disciples, like Jesus, we don't know why they're apart, but, you know, maybe Jesus was praying or healing somebody or something like this. And, and so, but this father, there's a father, and his son was, um, was sick. He was sick mentally. He was sick spiritually. He was sick emotionally. Um, he didn't have a physical condition per se, um, but he did have some spiritual stuff at play. And so this father thought, man, if I can get my son near Jesus, if I can get my son with the, his disciples, then something can happen. But as he shows up, there is a group of Pharisees or religious leaders or teachers of the day along with the disciples, and they don't have any agreement over uh, what, what can actually be done spiritually with this man's son. So Jesus shows up in the midst of an argument. He's like, hey, what's going on? And the father says, hey, I have a son who is tormented by an evil spirit. He's tormented mentally. He's tormented physically. He's tormented by the spirit. And my hope is that you will be able to bring some healing his way. My hope is that you'll be able to bring some healing his way. And so Jesus looks around at the disciples and he looks around at the religious leaders and he's like, okay, bring the boy to me. So verse 20 says in Mark chapter number 9, they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw that it was Jesus, it, the spirit, threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground writhing and foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has this been happening? And the boy's father replied, since he was a little boy, and I want to just take a pause right there. Let's call time out right there because this is a genius question that Jesus asked right here. It's genius. Now, you and I, if we were in the midst of this situation, we'd be asking this question, you know, like, how, how are you with this situation? Like, how are you doing, you know? Like, I know your, your son's having a really tough time. Like, how are you doing? We might ask a question like, well, how's he doing? I mean, he's been navigating this for the entirety of his life, for most of his life, the majority of his life, the, for a long time. Like, how's he doing? How's he recovering? I mean, we're asking the question like, what can I do? Can, can we set up a, a meal train? Can we, you know, like drop by some goodies or gifts or something? But Jesus didn't ask any of that. 
And I don't think Jesus didn't ask that because he didn't care. I think Jesus didn't ask that because Jesus is a genius. And I think that he was trying to set us up for some things that we need to be asking ourselves as well. And there's a reason for it. Because Jesus knew. He knew how long it had been happening. Jesus knew. He knew what he could do to help. Jesus knew. He knew the answer to the problem. But he also knew how life goes. And he knows how you and I and our minds work. He knew that the length of time that this had been happening could be a determining factor for the level of faith that that family was operating in. He knew that the longer that it had lasted, the more likely that they were to have big doubts and little faith. Jesus knew where the man's faith was, but Jesus wanted the man to know where the man's faith was. See, Jesus doesn't have a question about where your faith is. He knows where your faith is. The problem with our faith is we don't most times know where our faith is. We think that our faith is good because we go to church. We think that our faith is good because we prayed a prayer one time. We think that our faith is good because, well, my wife has faith, so I must have some faith too. But Jesus wanted this man to know. I know you're here, and I know that this is a step of faith. But you got to realize where your faith actually is. And no matter where you find yourself today, I promise you that the Holy Spirit wants to try to help you gauge where your faith actually lies. But we must allow God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to help us determine where our faith is. If I'm taking notes today, the thing that I'm writing down is, God, help me identify, help me determine where my faith is today. Because maybe you think that it's lower than it actually is. Or maybe, sometimes even more dangerous, you think it's higher than it actually is. The reality of the situation, all of us have faith because we've talked about this. God and his goodness and his grace because he loves us so much, because he cares for us so much he's given us a certain measure of faith but as Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says we have to be honest in our evaluation of where that faith is so whether it grows or not our faith it's determined not by well where it's at currently it is determined by where we choose to focus and how close we'll get to Jesus. That's why I love this man's story because he brought his son to Jesus and when he did, he got close to Jesus. But it, he didn't settle for just getting close to Jesus. And you can't settle for just getting close to Jesus. You've also got to fix your focus on Jesus. Our faith levels will always be determined by our focus and closeness to our Heavenly Father. We have to realize that as we move forward, our faith levels will always be determined by our focus and closeness to our Heavenly Father. So let's jump back into the scripture, shall we? The Father continues in verse 22. He says this, The Spirit often throws him into the fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. And Jesus asks, What do you mean if I can? Anything. Somebody say anything. Anything is possible if a person believes. Let me say believes. So anything is possible if a person only believes. And again, I kidded last week, and I'm going to kid again, but I looked up that word, anything. And guess what it means? We don't even need the whiteboard for that. Anything means anything. But specifically, I like this definition because it means each and everything. All things, it means the whole thing. Somebody say the whole thing. And this word believes, I love this definition as well. It means to have faith or to be confident in God. Have faith or be confident in God. Now, many of us get caught up in thinking that faith is 
believing in God and seeing that God will do what we want God to do, rather than faith actually being having faith in God and trusting that God will do what he sees fit. See, most of us, the reason that we get tripped up in our faith is because we will believe in God and trust in God and have confidence in God and faith in God as long as God will do what we want God to do. But that's not faith, everybody. Sometimes you're going to walk through trials and tribulations and sometimes you're going to seemingly walk through hell. But it doesn't mean that God isn't present. It doesn't mean that God isn't with you. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have you. What it means is that you have an opportunity to establish what is actually faith. Trusting in God even when things don't go your way. Even when things don't feel just A-OK. Even then, you have an opportunity to really build And establish your faith. We've got to understand, we've got to realize that God's thoughts are higher than ours. And his ways are higher than ours as well. My favorite part of these two definitions that I just read you falls in anything. The part that says whole. And that word whole means all of or the entire thing. So get this, everybody. God doesn't do things in part, and he doesn't stop short. So by faith, we can be sure that if it's not good, and if it's not whole, then God's not done. Sometimes we can see God working. Sometimes we, can, we, can per- we perceive that God is doing something, but there's still pain. There's still, uh, there's still something that feels incomplete on the inside of us. And because we learn how to trust God and that God in his goodness doesn't always give us what we want, but he always gives us what he sees fit, we can trust that if it's not completely good, if it's not completely whole, then God just isn't done yet. And I've just purposed in my heart it doesn't matter if he's not done in a day or it doesn't matter if he's not done in a week, if he's not done in a month or not done in a year, maybe he's not even done in this lifetime. I will still choose to lean in and trust by faith. it's not complete, it's not good, it's not whole, then it's not done. God's still working. And he can accomplish anything. So let me say anything if a person believes. Don't let your belief be dictated to by what you see. Something was sparked in the Father, in the Father's faith as Jesus was saying this to him and The Bible goes on to say in verse 24 that the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. I love this. He cried out. And I I think that this is the thing for us culturally, guys, here in the Midwest, in Nebraska, in church, man, we're just good church folks. You know, we come in and we leave and we went to church, we swiped that spiritual time card and we are good to go because we checked in at church. Everything is all right from Now on, right? But I love this father. He cried out. He didn't think out. He didn't sit out. He didn't stand stoically out. He cried out. He cried out from a place of desperation for change according to the word that he was experiencing. He heard something in Jesus' words. He saw something in the living word. He saw something in the scripture that caused him to be stirred in faith, that caused him to cry out from a place of desperation, say, you know what, I haven't seen it yet. But I'm believing that it can take place, even though that at the same time I've got belief, I've also got unbelief. I believe it, but then I don't at the same time. And I know that I'm conflicted, and I know that I'm a little torn, and I know that I'm one way and then the other. Jesus, you're saying something that's stirring something on the inside of me. 
And I want to believe it, but I just, I'm not sure that I can believe it. And what so many of us do is that causes us, when we're conflicted inwardly, it causes us to sit down. It causes us to isolate. It causes us to disconnect. It causes us to create distance, doesn't it? But that's not what God has called us to do. He's called us to lean in. He's called us to step forward. He's called us to open our mouths and lift our voices. He's called us to be desperate. I love that the father cried out. There was a renewed sense of faith on the inside of him. He wasn't faithless anymore. But there was still a certain level of weakness of faith. Even in his desperation, the determination had been made in that moment. I still have doubt. I hear what you're saying. I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm, I'm perceiving what you want to do. So I'm not completely without faith. But there's still a weakness of faith. There's still some sprinkles of doubt. And isn't that just how the enemy works? Causing us to think that if we don't have it all together all the time, that we don't really need to step back and follow Jesus any of the time. Like if you don't have it, I mean, I know this is what the enemy does to me. Like in this moment, there's still sprinkles of doubt. Like I believe, but can you? I wonder if you can help my unbelief. And I know that in those moments, especially as somebody who's called to lead a church, I can imagine that God does, or the enemy does it in people who maybe aren't necessarily called to lead, but you're a part of a church and you're following Jesus, that either you have it all together all of the time or you don't follow Jesus any of the time. And what it does is it causes us to want to distance ourselves. Because we don't think that we're perfect. But can I tell you something? You don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus. You just have to be willing, desperate to pursue him for a moment. That's it. That's all you got to do. You don't have to be perfect. And you got to stop buying the lies of the enemy. You don't have to have it all together all of the time. To still follow Jesus all of the time. The father was saying here, by faith, I know that I'm stuck. I feel like I'm surrounded on all sides. I believe, but then I don't believe either. He was saying by faith, hey, help me overcome. Help me rise above this weakness of faith. Help me strike the on from my belief system so that I can just believe instead of be stuck or saddled with this unbelief. I imagine it like this. I imagine the father stepping forward, leaning in, coming close to Jesus. Saying, Jesus, I'm hearing what you're saying. And I feel some of it, but not all of it. All of these years, all of this time has created so much distance, has created so much weakness of faith. For me, I believe, but man, can you help my unbelief? Just being able to look in Jesus' eyes and realize, I want you close. I want you close. This father showed us what it looks like to be desperate. And I think that's important because all of us at times waffle in our faith, don't we? I mean, maybe you don't. Maybe it's just me. But I think all of us from time to time will waffle in our faith. We've all experienced those moments, man, where we are full of faith, where we know that God's going to move the mountain where we know that God has equipped me, man, I feel like I'm ready to storm hell with a water pistol, man. Like, let's go. You know what I'm saying? Like, just those moments, we all have those moments. 
But then don't we all also have those moments on the flip side? Where we feel like we can't get out of bed, where we can't go another day, where God has completely forgotten about us. I know that for me, for the last several years, I'm going to get vulnerable here for a few minutes. And you're either going to appreciate it and stay and become more committed to this house and what God's doing here than ever before, or you're going to leave and go find another church with a perfect pastor. So I'm just going to risk it. And I'm just going to tell you where I've been for the last couple of years. A couple of years. Probably closer to three years. I'm a big faith guy. A big faith guy. You know, not many of you guys picked up your family and moved across the country to plant a church in a place you didn't know. I, I'm a big faith guy. And I can remember getting here to Lincoln and Pastor Kerry and I, after meeting several people, we just... We said, man, this is probably the least spiritually minded place I've ever been. Met with lots and lots of pastors. There are so many great churches, but we just, we were meeting pastors in, those, in that season that um, it just, it was so discouraging. They're just telling us how hard it was to, to be in church life. And, you know, if you are going to be successful, especially in Lincoln, you're going to have to go to the south side of town. If you're going to be successful in Lincoln, you're going to have to water down your message. If you're going to be successful in Lincoln, you're going to have to tickle the ears of the people that are coming in the life of your church. And it's just not what we felt called to at all. You know, it's just not what we felt called to. We felt called to have home base always on the north side of O Street. I don't know what that's going to look like as we move forward, but that's just how we feel called. That doesn't mean we're going to become a north side, um, you know, neighborhood church because that's not who we're called to be either. So we're not going to be boxed into that either. We know that we're supposed to be a regional church with regional impact. But anyway, in the, in the midst of all of this, I can, I can start, slowly start feeling myself forgetting to, like, forgetting to, feeling like I was forgetting how to pray forgetting how to like pray by faith and the majority of my prayer times over the last several years have been simply reminding myself that I'm a man of faith that I do believe that God can do what he says he wants to do that he has called me here and I've been a part of prayer and fasting for six to seven times since this has started to go on in my mind and I've literally told my wife I think I'm going crazy Because I know that God can do what he says. I know he can do it, what the, what the word says. I know he can do what he placed in our hearts. I know he can. But I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. I don't feel like I'm experiencing it. I feel like I have more doubts than I do faith. I feel like the majority of my prayer time is just, Matt, get your mind in line with God's word. I've prayed hundreds and hundreds of times with no result. I've prayed hundreds and hundreds of times not hearing God's voice. I've prayed hundreds and hundreds of times not feeling like I know which way to go. But everybody's still looking at me saying, Pastor, which way do we go? And so by faith, not a feeling, I just keep saying, let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. Faith is not about a feeling. It's about a knowing. It's not about an answered prayer. It's about a promise. It's not about this, that, or the other thing. It's literally about the person of Jesus. And if anybody in your world ever convinces you or tells you that it's about them being perfect, then they are God and not God is God. I think we got to be honest, like I believe, but help me in my unbelief. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed this prayer. Father, please help me in the places that I'm struggling to believe. 
And on Monday morning during prayer, I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me more clearly than he's spoken to me in years. And I feel like he said that this is the season that he's pulling the spiritual cover off the eyes of people in our culture, in our region, so that we can see things in the spirit that God has promised, see things over your lives that God has promised, and that we'll be spiritually minded people. We don't have to be wackadoos or crazy, but we can see things in the spirit. But can I tell you what you have to do? Continue to align yourself in the spirit. And there's got to be a desperation that wells up on the inside of you. That whenever you don't experience the stuff, you still continue to pursue the person. I'm going to skip down to the end of verse 28. Well, I'll read, I'll read the Bible. The Bible is the most important part. Verse 25, when Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers and they were growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. He said, listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to speak or hear. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. And then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into a violent convulsion and left him. And the boy appeared to be dead and a murmur ran through the crowd. And the people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and he helped him to his feet. And the boy stood. And afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, the disciples asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? We were standing here looking stupid. And you walked up and made like... Why couldn't I do it? Why couldn't we do it? There's more of us than there is of you. Why couldn't we? And Jesus said, this kind can only be cast out by prayer. And the last thing I want to draw your attention to is the word prayer. This isn't the type of prayer that many of us are used to culturally. Again, like I said, that even with all the great churches, we live in one of the least spiritually minded regions that I've ever lived in personally. We've got great churches but not a lot of spirituality. And I'm not saying anything against anybody. I just know what we're called to. And this is a message for our church to encourage us in our spiritual pursuit of the person of Jesus, allowing the Spirit of God to take over some things and some places in our lives. But the type of prayer that we're used to, we're used to bedtime prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord we're used to mealtime prayers. Thank you, Jesus, for this food. Or rub-a-dub-dub, this is super good grub, or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I started doing this intentionally when we moved here. I almost never pray over my meals. Because it's a religious thing that we do culturally. I certainly refuse to only pray over my meals if I don't have a personal prayer time or the kind of prayer that can move a mountain or the kind of prayer that can help me overcome my unbelief or the kind of prayer that is set aside, the kind of prayer that Jesus is addressing here is the kind of prayer that you will take time out of your day. You will carve space out of your day to be in his presence and to experience his goodness. The type of prayer that Jesus is talking about in this moment is a spiritual connection to the heart of the Father. It's an opportunity, it's a desperation to come close. This isn't the type of prayer that we just happen to stumble on and discover. It's the type of prayer that we intentionally develop in connection with the Holy Spirit. It's the very reason that we carve out two times a year for us corporately to pray and fast. Our prayer and our hope is that you also carve out time intentionally, personally, to pray and fast. It's a natural part of Pastor Carrie and I's rhythm. Many of our staff, their rhythm, our leaders, their rhythm. Our hope is that you do that personally too, aside from just the two times that we do corporately. I started this rhythm about 22 years ago when I first gave my heart to Jesus. There's a little tiny chapel in Hastings, Nebraska, and that's where I grew up and I'm from. And I would walk over to this chapel, 
And I can remember spending the night in this chapel many, many, many times just in the presence of God. Just because I desperately knew that I needed to be in God's presence. But what God was doing in, in the midst of my desperation is he was developing something on the inside of me that could sustain me in the midst of some spiritual wilderness that the Spirit of God spoke to me about Monday. Sometimes I'll lead you in places where you don't feel fulfilled. And it doesn't feel like everything's coming together or perfect. But I'm there with you. And I'm there with you to speak to you, to lead you, to encourage you, to carry you through, no matter what you feel like. But this was developed in me 22 years ago at this prayer chapel. It wasn't developed in me because I prayed for my meals. And it wasn't, it wasn't developed in me when I said the bedtime prayers with the kids. It was developed in me when I'm not a morning person, but I started waking up in the morning. And now I'm not a night person, but sometimes the Lord asks me to stay up at night. And I like my sleep, but sometimes the Lord gets me up out of bed and he says, Matt, I want to speak to you. And so I'm there. So as we continue to take next steps in our faith journey, there are going to be times where you have faith and you have doubt. Where you have belief and you have unbelief. But what we're looking at here is allowing the Holy Spirit to strike the un in our unbelief so that we can just believe. And as we do, it's our opportunity as sons and daughters of God to overcome those doubts by His Spirit. And there are three keys that I want to share with you as we're finishing up. Three keys to overcome our unbelief. Key number one, allow God to determine where your faith actually is. Take some honest inventory and come to the conclusion of that real answer. You cannot fix what you think is whole. You cannot address something that you think is intact. And so honestly allow God to help you determine where your faith is. The second thing is become desperate for a faith alignment to God's word. Not to your Christian friends, not to the Christian radio, not to, um, not that any of those things are bad, not to the way that you came up in church. But become desperate for a faith alignment to God's word to you right now. What does God say to you right now in this season? Let us be people who are desperate to come into alignment with that. And the third thing that we do is we intentionally develop a deeper connection with God by setting aside space and time. Most all of us have a space. A space where, if, if Pastor Kerry and I go back to a space where we used to go and make out, it's a special place for us. If you have a thought about that space or, you know, you have a special place with your, like from childhood memories or whatever, you have spaces that take you back, right? We got to have spaces like that with the Lord as well, where we spend time with God, where we've spent time with God, where we've developed some intimacy with God that we allow God to change us in that place and that you've got to make time to be in that space so that God can continue to help us strike the un from our belief you're always going to be with unbelief guys I'm telling you the only way to remedy it is to get close to step in is to lean in with your father will you stand up I want to pray for you is that okay come on if you're comfortable would you lift your hands father I say oh oh come on my soul 
Don't you get shy on me. Don't you get shy on me. Lift up this song. You got a lion inside of those lungs. God, I declare over every single person of the sound of my voice that we will be people that praise the Lord, that we lean in from a place of desperation where we experience you in fullness. God, that we would lean into faith over doubt. We would look in the face of doubt and we would declare we're desperate for the presence of the Lord. And we know that we can put the fellow in the spirit. We will not be shy. We will not be timid. We will not be laid back. We will not offer wrong. But we will be confident in the things that God has called us to. So God, I declare today in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, don't you be shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those songs. Get up there and praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion. 